church, let's stand to our feet tonight. Let's put our hands together and praise God. Come on. to the free. 
church, give Jesus a shout of praise. He is worthy. Yes, Father, we worship you tonight. We invite you in this place. We ask that you would move, Jesus. Have your way.
church across this room, just lift your hands right now. Just worship Jesus. He is worthy of our praise. Oh, you're so good, Lord, yes. There's no one like you, no one like you, yes. Oh, we praise your mighty name. You're so good, God. Come on, let's sing that chorus all together. You are my champion. Come on, church. Sing your love is devoted. And your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant to vote. And your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the with mercy, come on, let's sing. Faithful He's been, and faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise. Come on, ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. To you father the orphan and you father the orphan his kindness makes us whole and you'll shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own now you're making me like you lord you're clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes your bride, come on, and free of all and rid of all her shame, and known by her true name, and it's why I sing you praise, will ever be on my lips, ever be Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, and you will be praised, and you will be praised with angels and saints. Thank 
angels and saints, we sing worthy. Come on, sing it out, because he will be. Because you will be praised, yes. You will be praised, Lord. With angels and saints, we sing worthy. Are you alone? And you will be praised. And you will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing worthy. Are you alone? And that's why I sing your praise. Will ever be on my lips? Ever be on my lips? Your praise. Ever be on my lips? Your praise. Ever be on my lips? Ever be on my lips? Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Oh, we sing to you, oh, we sing to you today, Lord. Your praise, it'll be on our sing that chorus together because your praise your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips We praise you, Jesus We praise your mighty name Come on, let's just sing it one more time Because your praise Your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Father, we're thankful for your presence tonight in this room as we lift up the name of Jesus. Your name will ever be on our lips. Jesus, all of this belongs to you. It's all for you. We worship you. We lift up your mighty name. In your name, amen. Amen. Hey, isn't God good? Go to the shout of praise. Amen. Hey, as the youth are heading out, why don't you find someone around you? Give them a high five. Tell them they're looking good in the snow today. Looking good in the snow. God bless you guys. Well, good evening, church. So good to see you. Y'all look good tonight. Do you know that we were voted best looking church in the Treasure Valley? I just voted and it was just me, but uh, that's what it's counted. But so good to see you guys. Uh, we can blame Pastor Stevie for the snow once again. So, um, yeah, that's okay. We're going to nickname him Blizzard or something like that. Cause, uh, but, uh, but it was a good snow day, wasn't it? Did anybody have to work in it? Anybody have to plow it? My hands up. All right. We plowed so you could show up tonight. Uh, but I am so thankful that God has seasons in life. And uh, if anything, living in Idaho helps you understand that if you really pay attention, that life is full of seasons. As we were plowing snow today and done, my son said, I just want to live in Hawaii. 72 all the time. No problem. It would be very boring, but I don't think he would get bored. Uh, and so as we go through life, and uh, I'm going to do my best tonight. Again, thank you so much for all your prayers. Um, thanks for Pastor Stevie filling in last Wednesday and, and Sunday kind of on a whim. Um, I couldn't talk without coughing, so I thought that would be a little bit uh, distracting to you. Yeah, thank you. All right, because it would be. Um, I also didn't want to give it to you. Uh, so whatever I had, uh, whoever I got it from, thank you very much for the lesson in compassion. 
because I'll tell you something, if you never get sick, you rarely have compassion for those who are. Do I need to say that again? If you, if you don't get sick, you rarely have compassion for people that aren't. I think God allows us at times um, to catch things. You know, this, this world is not heaven, right? It's not hell either. But these bodies, if anything, if sickness is a reminder that it's just a temporary place. And so if you're facing something tonight that you would rather not be facing, and I'm sure I would get everybody would raise a hand if, if I could say, are you facing something right now that you wish you weren't facing? All of us would think of something. The life is full of those things. Life is full of hardships. And the important thing, as we're going to learn tonight, is that when we complain too much during those hardships, it gets God's attention. Um, in our lesson tonight, it's not the kind of attention that you want God to give you. Can I start with a question? Actually, that was a question. I'm going to start with a question. How many of you just enjoy being around complainers? Can you just lift your hand up? Just, I just enjoy it. just fills me up, makes me feel good about life. Okay. No, nobody here, nobody online, I'm sure, is raising their hand. Uh, we don't like hanging around complainers. Now, let me ask another question. Do we at times complain? Okay, there's a difference between a complainer and complaining. Okay, complaining gives you human emotion to say, this isn't any fun. But a complainer is like a character thing. So it, it is, is something we're going to see tonight where God kind of gets mad Actually, he, does, he starts a big fire. He gets pretty angry. When God starts a fire around you, like a literal fire, you know he's not too happy with you. And uh, so as we go from, uh, again, the exodus out of, and again, forgive me if I'm a little cloudy because my brain's still a little cloudy. And some of you are like, what's new? I could tell, right? I could, could tell. Um, so whatever it is that got me, it got into my mind as well. Um, but as they are journeying from Egypt to the promised land, there's this process that they go through. Um, I, I got a speeding ticket. Can I confess that? I got a speeding ticket. I know. I was in high school. It was 1989 when I got my speeding ticket. And how I got my speeding ticket, if you've been here very long, you, you know the story. Um, I was in high school in Oregon. I went to a Christian uh, private school that we lived at, and we lived on, um, on the... Uh, I grew up on the California side of the Oregon border, and, uh, but it was about a three-hour drive if the pass was open. If anybody's familiar with Cave Junction or Grants Pass, uh, there was kind of a shortcut that we could take uh, down, the, down the freeway uh, to, go, to get to where I lived. And uh, one weekend, my uh, friends and I were decided to go home uh, for the weekend, and so we knew there was snow, and we called ahead, and from what we understood, there was, it, the roads were clear, and so we could take this a shortcut called Grayback, and it would say, shave an hour off the time. We didn't have to go through, um, I think it was like Mount, Mount, by Mount Shasta. And so we get in the truck, and we're driving, and we're going through Cave Junction. And we're getting up to the, the hill, and the snow is getting a little bit deeper, but the roads are clear. It's sunny. It's beautiful. And we come up on the top of the mountain, and they decided that it wasn't their job to push snow past the Oregon-California border. And so there was probably a 15-foot tall pile of snow in the middle of the road um, that both sides pushed to. And we climbed up on it, and it was clear on the other side, dry pavement. And we're like, what in the world? And we're like, okay, how do, what do we do here? I uh, didn't have a shovel to dig, and it would have taken forever to dig anyway. And so, lo and behold, a shortcut. Anybody ever taken a shortcut? It's usually not a shortcut. Uh, it ended up taking us eight hours because we had to go all the way back to where we came from and go around. Well, in the process, I got a speeding ticket from a CHP guy who said he paced me going 10 over, and um, I wanted to argue with him, but it's not wise to argue with a cop because it just, you know, there was no radar back then, but somehow he threw these, these windy roads that we were on. Um, I was speeding. I don't know if I was going 10 over, but, but he said I was, so I got the ticket. And now I want to tell you that there was a, a delay, but it, it wasn't my fault. You ever been delayed and it wasn't your fault? Like there was a delay in something you had, it was like I, I checked, I, I called ahead, they said it was open, wasn't open. Sometimes a delay is not our fault, but other times it is. And so um, if you have the notes tonight, there's two titles that I could come up with. One of them was Delivered But Delayed. Uh, they were delivered out of Egypt, but they were delayed in getting to the promised land. The problem was that it's about a seven-day walk from Egypt to the promised land, and it ended up taking 40 years. And you know why it took 40 years? Mostly because of disobedience. 
mostly because the Israelites, they, they didn't like what was going on. They didn't like this. They liked the deliverance, but they didn't like what was going on in between. Uh, and so we're, as Christians, delivered from slavery or sin, okay, which would be Egypt in this case. And there's a promised land at the end of the journey. And so God, again, promised the Israelites, hey, I'm going to get you out of slavery. I'm going to deliver you to the promised land. And they would say it's a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where the fruit is abundant. The fruit is huge, as we'll see in a couple of weeks when they go explore it. But the struggle is in between. You and I know, like, we're saved, right? If we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, we know that when we die, heaven is our home. The problem is, is the struggle in between there. It, it's we're delivered, but there's a delay in, in salvation. I'm, I'm sorry, a, a delay in heaven. Um, and have you ever been delayed and it was your fault? Anybody ever do something that, like, you did? <laughs> you, it's like, I, I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have made this choice. Uh, all of us have probably heard the voice inside of us, which is the Holy Spirit saying, don't do that. And we decided against it. Anybody besides me, I saw, I saw a hand over there. All of us have done that, right? All of us have heard the voice and did it anyway. The problem with these guys, again, the, the delay was in the disobedience. But what I want to speak to just for a moment is, is what happens when there's a delay and it's not your fault? What happens when there's a delay and you did obey? You did what was right. Like the story of Joseph where he just wanted to serve God and he did the best of his ability, but he got thrown in prison. And it was a 13-year you know, period from the promise that he got uh, that he would be in leadership until he actually obtained that position. He was falsely accused. Okay? Potiphar's wife said, you know, he tried to rape me and he didn't. He actually told her no several times. What happens when the delay happens when you do obey? Here's what I want you to, to hear from tonight is there's always a reason for God's delays. So if you feel like right now I'm just delayed and I don't know what I did, I don't know if I did anything wrong, I didn't do anything wrong, there's just a delay, you need to understand God has a plan for that. God has a plan. God is setting something else down the road up, okay, and, and your time is not yet. You know, a delay, hear this, a delay is not always denial. It's just a delay, and God has a reason for his delays. So the last lesson in Leviticus, that was just the opening. Can I get an amen? Everybody tired tonight? All right. Okay, good. Then that'll excuse your lack of participation in my preaching. Um, Because I'm not hearing much back from you tonight. Uh, You're almost as quiet as the online crowd. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, that, that works. Um, so the last lesson in Leviticus, some of you, um, it, it's tithing. It has nothing to do with the rest of the time. But the last lesson from Leviticus uh, is tithing. And some of you say, well, where did tithing come from? Well, New Testament, Old Testament, we'll talk about it. Um, and in Leviticus, it, chapter 27, verse 3, it says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain or soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. So if you ever wonder, hey, where did tithing come from? Leviticus talks about it. Tithing actually means, if anybody know what tithe actually means? It means tenth, okay? So you can't, you can't tithe 20%. You can give an extra 10%, but tithe actually means, uh, actually means tenth. So that's where they came from. Um, that God established that, and that was for the leaders um, and the priests to be able to do their job. So if you get fed spiritually, uh, that's where... Uh, that's where tithe came from to take care of the priest. So, all right, let's get into the, the main part of the story. Let's recap just a little bit, um, and I'm just going to read from the notes here for just the sake of time. All right, so the Israelites were delivered from Egypt. Uh, they were delivered from slavery, de- delivered from death. God, God did incredible miracles and set their course for the promised land, which was called Canaan. And we'll see that although God brought them out of Egypt, it was a lot harder to get Egypt out of them. They're going to want to go back. And through our lesson, as we go to the book of Joshua, um, where they actually start to take the promised land, we're going to see over and over again that the Israelites would forget what God did for them. They would become ungrateful. They would be complainers. They would be whiners. They they would just look for things to complain about. And, And over and over and over again, God got very frustrated with them because of their complaining. And so tonight, what I want us to do, especially at the end, uh, to think about When is the last time you caught yourself complaining and stopped yourself? And when is the last time you caught yourself complaining and went, you know what, I'm really complaining? That was a question, all right? How many of us actually stop ourselves and go, you know, I'm just a whiner right now. I'm just a complainer. Sometimes we'll do that, right? Like I was complaining about something on the home today and then I was telling my brain, it's like, it's okay, it's okay. Because we all have our moments, right? 
We can, we can quietly complain and go, this isn't the way that I thought it was going to be, but that's okay. The problem, again, is, is it's habitual complaining. And again, God gets them out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. They're going to want to go back. Matter of fact, they're going to want to like kill Moses and go back. And they're like, we should just go back to Egypt. And not much has changed with humans. We want the benefits of the freedom we have in Jesus, but uh, oftentimes we don't want to let go of the world very easy. I would say that if the world sees your life and they don't see really any difference between a worldly person and a Christian, you need to reevaluate your Christianity. And I'm not telling you you should take your Bible to work and thump everybody with it. That is a very effective way of, of evangelism. People get saved every day. No, that's not effective. Living it first, right? And then they wonder, man, they're different. Okay? Bible thumping, to my knowledge, has never really saved people. Knocking on people's doors that you don't know and telling them they're going to go to hell if they don't get right with God uh, is not a very effective way of evangelism. You living a life as an overcomer, going through stuff, making mistakes, and admitting those mistakes, that's what people see. That is the best form of evangelism there is, is you show people that, that serving God doesn't make you perfect, but it, it, again, it makes you, makes you forgiven, but he, God helps you through things. People want to know, is God real? And you may be, again, the only Jesus they ever see. So how are we doing in that? So the Israelites, okay, they're excited to leave Egypt. Okay, matter of fact, they plundered them. God made it so that they basically plundered Eat all the Egyptians, took their gold and everything. Uh, but the feeling didn't last long once they ran into hardships. And I've seen that over and over again. People will give their life to Jesus and everything is great for a couple weeks. And then that worldly thing starts to creep back in. Okay, the feeling begins to kind of go away. And, and my, my youth pastor in the old days used to call it the call of the wild. And he would preach every summer, but right before school got out to his youth group, that the, the call of the wild is going to get you. Like the call of the wild will try to take you to places that you, you shouldn't be going. You're going to get friends that try to get you to do things you shouldn't be doing. But there's always a call of the wild on our lives. And there's always a call, maybe not to go out and backslide hard, but there's always a, a call on our hearts to maybe gossip or maybe get angry in traffic or angry at your spouse or angry at your kids. There's always that wildness in us that wants to do what it wants to do. And I've often said that a Christian life is like living with a car that needs an alignment. Like as soon as you let go of the steering wheel, what's it want to do? Okay, and we have two options. There's commercial, there's Les Schwab. We represent both tonight. I do expect to kick back for the advertisement. Um, but we should try to live knowing we are forgiven of our past. And at the same time, we need to remember the pain that living in sin brings so we don't go back to it. How many people do you know that have gone back to that thing that God delivered them out of? All of us do, right? All of us do because God makes it clear that we know us, <laughs> that we have gone back at times to that thing that God has delivered us out of. And um, I want to go to Romans chapter 7 real quick because the Apostle Paul, I love the Apostle Paul, he, he nails this thing um, in Romans chapter 7 about this old nature that we fight on a consistent basis. All right, Romans chapter 7. And here's, here's what he says. Uh, we'll start with verse 14. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual. This is Paul, okay? The Apostle Paul writes half the New Testament, gets saved radically, and he still has this thing that he fights. He goes, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Again, radically delivered. He says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. It, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. He's not blaming the devil. He's not like the devil made me do it. He's saying there's this nature in me that keeps wanting to go back to the thing I was delivered out of. And I keep fighting it. And the important thing for us to understand is this is the Apostle Paul, guys. This is, this is the man who God chose to write half the New Testament, best evangelist, greatest evangelist in the history of mankind. Again, and, and as a writer, as God is using him, he's saying, I still struggle with this. That should make us feel a little bit better, that we're not as godly as the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul is like, all these things that are coming against me, I don't want to do them, but I end up doing it. And so I understand, he goes, it's a sin nature that in, that's in me. He goes, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. 
for what I do is not the good that I want to do. No, the evil I don't want to do, I keep doing it. Anybody relate to this? <laughs> yeah, like all of us, if, if you're a Christian and you're breathing, uh, we should be able to relate to this. He says, now if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. Again, he's not making this excuse for himself. He's just saying there's some nature in me that keeps doing the things that I don't want to do. So I find this law at work. Whenever I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but in another law at work against the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And here he gives the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I love that because he, he's, he is acknowledging the battle is real. Like the, the battle against sin, the battle against this thing that keeps coming after me, it's a real thing. Now, I don't know everything. Paul doesn't always, he's not really open about what he struggled with. Um, he was a single guy. It's a good chance that maybe he struggled with, with women that were following him. And, um, you know, you could call them buckle bunnies and all that. I don't know what an evangelist bunny would be. Um, maybe that's what it was. They, they thought, oh, this guy's great. You know, I don't know what he looked like or whatnot. Um, but I'm sure he was pursued by women. You know, he was a single guy. Like his life wouldn't have been very good for a marriage because he traveled all the time uh, preaching the gospel. But he was still a man. Yeah, he still had temptations. He still had things. Um, he did have a little bit of a temper. I mean, it's, you could tell he was a pretty intense dude. Uh, but I love the fact that he just says, I can't control this flesh on my own. I can't do it. I have to have Jesus. I have to have the power of the Holy Spirit in order to contain this thing. So I love the fact that he struggled because it doesn't make me feel too bad when I struggle. Can I get an amen? All right, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that Paul writes that. All right, so let's go back to uh, Numbers, uh, chapter 10, verse 11 through 13. Uh, here's what they did. It says, uh, actually, chapter, yeah, chapter 10. So here's what, what happened. All right, because I'm going to jump around just a tiny bit. It says, on the 20th day of the second month, of the second year, the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the testimony. Now, if you haven't been in the study, you're like, yeah, and the cloud lifted. Well, in this time, as God was leading them through the desert, uh, they've been um, at Mount Sinai, camping at the base of it for about two years. So it's been a two-year period, roughly, that they've been camped out. And when God led them out of Egypt, they were led by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. So the cloud, when it stopped, that's where they would camp. And when the cloud moved, that's when they would move. Don't you wish it was that easy for you to know when God wanted you to stay and when God wanted you to move? Wouldn't it be great if there was a cloud that you'd be like, oh, there's moving, okay. Because oftentimes we pray and we pray and we're like, God, can you make the cloud move? And God's like, no. That's, that's the answer I get most of the time. It's like, no, you just need to listen to me. You need to be patient. But there is typically no physical evidence of when you need to move on. Well, in this time and day, it was pretty easy. So two years, they're, they're camped out. And then it says on the 20th day, the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of testimony, and then it moved. It says, and then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place under the cloud. I'm sorry, until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran, they set out this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. So they finally get to move. They, they've been waiting for two years, and they were probably thinking it's about time that we get to go to the promised land. Like, we've been camping out. It hasn't been a whole lot of fun. Um, and so we're ready to move on. And so Moses, he, he talks to another guy named Hobob. If you're looking for a name for your newborn son, the Bible is the place to find one. There's Hobob, there's Ruel, um, there's some, some pretty cool names. There's Stanley, somewhere in Hebrew, I don't, I don't think there is, but uh, it says, now the people complained. Okay, that's, how, that's how chapter 11 starts out. Now let me give you some thoughts before we get there. The Israelites leave Sinai, it was obvious again when to leave, the cloud lifted. Again, sometimes it's obvious when God wants us to do something, but we're too stubborn to see it. You ever been there? Like, you, you, you're you like, people outside are going, dude, you need to move on, and you can't see. I've seen people in relationships where, you know, they're getting abused, and they're getting beaten, and bad things are happening, and they're still praying about whether they should stay in it. 
Could I tell you this? If you're in an abusive relationship and there's physical, I mean, that's, that's abusive, you don't have to pray about getting out. I don't know why I'm smiling and telling you that, but do you know you don't have to pray about that? Come on, give me some, give me an amen. Like, there's, there's abuse, all right? I'm not saying divorce. I'm saying there's a separation at times that sometimes it is very obvious, okay? And if you're in a relationship like that, come and talk to one of our staff pastors. We'll give you a, the same information I'm giving you now is that there's got to be a separation. There's got to be a separation at times. Some things, and it sounds unspiritual, sometimes you don't need to pray about things. How do I know that? There's stories in the Bible when they're praying and God's like, what are you doing? Deal with it. I love this. Like, it's, it's, we'll see it in, in Joshua. He's like, why are you praying? I'm seeking. He's like, deal with it. Like, I gave you the word. I gave you a brain. Use it. Come on. Okay? There's times that you don't have to pray about stuff. All right? You can just, just look at God's word and, and move on. Well, here, again, they move on. And sometimes we're delayed by our disobedience. Other times it's God's timing being set up. What we don't know is how long God had planned for them to be in the desert originally. That, that's the thing that I'm really puzzled about, thing that it went, maybe when I get to heaven, if we're not downloaded a bunch of information to ask God or to ask Joshua to say, how long were you guys supposed to actually be in the desert? Because here's, here's the truth. It's about a, an 11 day straight walk from where they were to, where, to the promised land. Like as a group, they could have made it there in about 11 days. So my, my questioning again is, okay, why were they two years Mount, in, in, under Mount Sinai? God had a plan for some reason. He didn't lead them straight to the promised land. Matter of fact, God doesn't even give them the promised land. They have to fight for it. And we'll get into that in Joshua. God doesn't just wipe out the enemy and say, hey, have at it. No, they had to actually fight their way into the promised land. But how long were they there? We don't know. But it would end up being a total of 40 years. And in this case... Their disobedience disqualified them. That's why they had to hang out. They, they were disobedient so much that God finally said, you know what, this whole generation is going to die before you guys enter into the promised land. It'll be your children and your grandkids that get the promised land. And Numbers, the book of Numbers, gives us a snapshot uh, for us to learn from our journey to the promised land. So again, they've camped below Sinai for two years. It's time to go. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, like if you want to study this week, actually refers to these stories as an example for us. Um, it brings up all the things in, that happened in Numbers, saying these are examples of how not to live. These are examples of what not to do. This is an example of how, how not to, to live for God in a complaining manner. I would much rather learn from your mistake than my own. I love it when one of you tell me, this is what I did. Like, I lost my finger doing this. Mental note, don't do that. <laughs> or I did this, and this is what happened. Okay, don't do that. I would much rather learn from, my, from your mistakes than my own mistake. I texted my wife before church, or on the way, actually, I was stopped. And there was a reason I was stopped, is coming out of my house, if you guys know where I live, um, down the lane, there's a sharp left-hand curve. And, um, and I plowed the road this morning, and I'm driving my car, me and Kayla, and I, I put my brakes on as I'm coming around the corner. And I was going probably the normal speed when the asphalt is dry. And I just kept going. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I'm going toward the, and I hit my parking brake just a tiny bit to get my car sideways because I wanted to line it up right. And, uh, and Kayla and I went off the road, and I just started laughing because I'm stuck. And I was like, okay, well, I could call Chris and have her bring the truck down, and I'm, I'm laughing. And, uh, and so I backed up actually a little bit, and then an angel pushed me out because I should have never got out of the ditch, but I did. Did you see my, did you see it? After you got here, she saw my text. I warned her. I said, the corner, corner by goes is really slippery, <laughs> and so she, I guess she didn't get the text. Um, but you didn't go off either, did you? Um, so anyhow, I just, I laughed because there's times that we're going to slide off the road. There's times that we're going to go a little faster than we should be. And it's not like you do it intentionally, but it's just the nature of life. What do you do when you make a mistake? What you should do is own the mistake. Because Kayla, if, if, you wanted, if you want the truth, an eight-year-old will tell you what the truth is. Like, Papa, you were going too fast, huh? Even though I wasn't speeding, yes, I was going too fast. Um, and then what do you do? You should pass that information on to somebody that you love terribly to say, hey, watch out, the corner is slippery. Now, if they choose not to read it until they get to church, then that's up to them. Um, the good news is you didn't go into the ditch, babe, because uh, I, I, I could say I told you so. 
Yeah, but she drives better than me, most likely. We will go off the road, okay? The thing is, is when we go off the road, use your story to help somebody else. Use your story. If you made mistakes in life, to see if you see somebody going on that trajectory to say, hey, I've been there. I know what happens. After, after you make a bad decision, this is what could happen. Use that story to help somebody else. And again, it could be preventative. It's interesting to study on behaviors of people. And here's the problem that I see in us is that we have the same DNA as the Israelites. Okay, the same seeds that are, if they're watered and they're fed, could produce the same results. Um, a common thought is, I would never do that. Has anybody ever said that? I would never do that. You see somebody do something dumb, and you're like, I would never do that. And then the Bible reminds us that pride comes before the fall. That when you say, I would never do that, I think the devil is challenged at those times. So just be careful when you say, I would never do that. Well, here's how I look at it. Okay, most of you know, like with my wife and I, we've only been with each other. And uh, we could see uh, somebody with, having an affair. You know, we've been faithful to each other. We only know each other. And for me to go, well, I would never do that, is one of the stupidest things I could ever say. Why is that? Because every single one of us are capable of doing it. Every single one of us. And, and when we think, hey, well, that could never happen to me, I think the devil takes that as a challenge, all right? And, and he doesn't work on you, you know, really quickly. He works on you very slow. We have to understand that in us, okay, that sin seed, if it's watered, if it's fed, it will grow. Now, I can tell you this, as long as I keep my heart right with Jesus, I will not cheat on my wife. As long as I keep my walk with God where it needs to be, I'll be faithful. But if I ever think I can do it on my own, if I ever lack my prayer life, if I ever quit studying the word of God, if I ever think, hey, I've arrived, I don't have to try anymore, I'm good. That is a dangerous place as a Christian, okay? We have to guard it. We have to protect it. Um, you know, unlike you, I would never drive a car off a road in ice. I just wouldn't. No? Okay? We have that seed in us. Now verse 1 of chapter 11. We've got about 15 minutes to finish this out. Are you ready? Now I'm going to start teaching. I just had to warm my voice up um, to get to this place. All right. Have you learned one thing so far? <laughs> one, okay, just tell me one, just tell me one. It says, now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord, and he heard them, and his anger was aroused. And then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. And when the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. Now, that place was called Tibera because fire from the Lord burned among them, and that, that word means burning. Let's talk about this just for a moment. They, they complained, and I, I kind of wonder, says, now that people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. Now, let's look at the setting here. Okay, they're camping. God is providing food for them. There's manna every day that comes down from heaven at night. They go out, they collect it. Okay, six days it comes down, and on the seventh day they weren't supposed to collect because it was a Sabbath day, but they were able to get twice as much, you know, on, a, on the Friday to feed themselves on the Saturday. But God is providing this manna. I don't know what it is. It might be Krispy Kreme for some of you. Um, I think it was peanut M&M's myself. But it, somehow this stuff would come down, and they could bake it. They could make bread. They could make a porridge. They could do all kinds of things, and, and God provided for them. They didn't have to till the ground. They didn't have to really plant or sow or anything. God provided for them. They're camping. The Bible says that their clothes never wore out. Their whole, their whole trip, the clothes never wore out. God has provided water for them. He's provided shelter. They have tents. They have family. They don't have jobs that they have to go do. And so I'm wondering, okay, it says they complained about their hardships. What was the hardship? And how many of y'all would like to go camping and, and you just are taken care of for two years? Anybody, you have to do anything. Like, it's just... I mean, maybe they had to dust a little bit because it might have been stormy. But I'm like wondering, okay, what were the hardships? And I want you to think about this for a moment because, again, oftentimes we read the word and we just read it as it is and we don't think about it. Why would God have gotten mad at them if it was actually a legit complaint? They're complaining about their hardships and God's anger burns so much that he just goes, just ignited fires around their camp. And they're like, oh, snap. Like, this, this is bad. They're like, Moses, we're going to get burned up. 
and God puts the fire out. Whatever they were complaining about made God angry. God didn't look down and say, you know what, you have a legit complaint. You're right. You don't have any water. You have a right to be, to be kind of mad about that. Or you have no food. You have a right to be mad. No, God has given them everything that they need to live, and they're complaining. I don't know that it was so much the situation that God was angry about, but the fact that they had this attitude is what God didn't like. How hard was it really? Okay, the complaining, I believe, became a habit. And habits are catching, okay? Have you ever, again, like I asked you this, this question, have you caught yourself complaining? What I want you to do this week is pay attention to possible complaints. Now, I'm not saying you can't complain about nothing because there are some things that we need to complain about in order to bring about change. But if you're a habitual complainer, okay, that's a hard issue. Because you know what complaining really is? It's ungratefulness. Think about your children. Let's talk about them for a while. It's more fun to talk about them than your issue. Okay? Right now, Pastor Dylan's in there teaching them um, about how hard they have it and how their parents are slave drivers and that they have a right to revolt and be angry. Now, he's telling them to suck it up, buttercup, like you've got good parents. They love you. That's why you're in church. But think about those things that we complain about that really are not very good complaints. Ladies, let me just talk to you just for a moment. How many of you have said in the last year, I have nothing to wear? Didn't think I'd get any answers. Husbands, if you answer me, you're in trouble. How many times have you heard your wife say, I have nothing to wear? Do not answer that question. Don't, don't do it publicly because you'll be in trouble. I have nothing to wear. How many husbands have complained about, I don't have enough guns? I just need another one. Okay. <laughs> Ladies, have you heard? All right. Yeah, just 10 more. It's just, you got to have what caliber for everything that you hunt and then one that you might start hunting with, right? We can complain about a lot of things. I would say in America, most of our complaints are illegitimate. Most of our complaints, there's not a lot of, it's like, I don't have anything. No, we have all kinds of things. We are very, very blessed here. We're very blessed here. So let me tell you the, some thoughts that I had through this thing. Here, here's, here's what they say, verse 4 through 9. It says the rabble, I love this. The, the, this, the, this. Moses is writing this. He describes this as the rabble. It's the same word, okay, listen to me. It's the same word that is used in Matthew when it says a group of people came to take Jesus away. The, you know, the group with their swords and their spears and their clubs and their fire, and they came when Jesus was in Gethsemane. They came to get him. The, it's the same word used, rabble. Okay, so what is that? What is rabble? Rabble are people who will take you in the wrong direction. Rabble are people who do not have in mind the things of God. The, and I love how he says the rabble among them. It's the, it's the influencers, but bad influencers. It's those people that complain loudest. And it sounds like there's a billion of them. There was a story that I heard about um, this guy went to eat at this little diner in this, this little country cafe, and he noticed that they didn't have frog legs on the menu, so he asked the owner. He says, how can we not have frog legs? He goes, I can't, I can't get frog legs. He said, I'd love to. And this guy goes, man, I live by this pond. He goes, every night there's thousands of frog legs. I mean, frogs, thousands. I mean, they drive me insane. And this guy says, I will buy them by the pound from you. If you can, he goes, I can get you all the pounds you want. He goes, I have tons of frogs. And so the owner's like, well, bring them in, and I'll buy them from you. So that night, the, the guy that lived by the pond, he went out, and he started collecting frogs, and he brought his catch in the next day. And the cafe owner looks at him, he goes, why do you only have four frogs? And the guy goes, well, by the sounds of them every night, I thought there was hundreds. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how four frogs can sound like a majority? This has nothing to do with politics in America at all, all right? Four frogs can sound very loud. That's the rabble that he's talking about. So I wanted to paint the frog picture by the rabble. The rabble with them begin to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we had in Egypt at no cost. And the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic but now we have lost our appetite. We never have anything but manna. That's all we got. All we have to eat now is manna. Do you remember onions? Oh, the onions. Do you remember the leeks and the garlics? Oh, yeah. Remember the spices that we had? Remember the fish? 
Yeah, and it says that all the people started going, we want what Egypt offered. What they didn't remember is that Egypt was killing their little boys. What they didn't remember is that slavery was killing them every day, that they had no freedom whatsoever. They were getting beat. Remember, if we studied, they had to make bricks, and then Egypt no longer provided straw to hold the bricks together. They had to go collect their own, but they had the same quota. They got beat severely. Life in Egypt was not good, and now all of a sudden they're thinking about the things that were good in Egypt and forgetting about the pain. And isn't that what the devil does to us, guys? He, he somehow causes us to remember the good part of the old life, which was probably very little, but not the bad part. When I worked painting as a, as a contractor, um, I, I was working for a contractor at the time, and there was this young man who grew up in the church and just backslid, and he started, he turned 21, started going to strip clubs, and, and I remember on Mondays, him coming in, just sicker than a dog, like, couldn't hardly work, just sick, 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 hung over, and he was talking about, the, oh, I'm never going to do that again, and I spent my whole paycheck on the strip club, and, and it was stupid, and I'm never going to do it again, and Tuesday would roll by, Wednesday, you know, by Thursday, guess what he was talking about doing on the weekend? going to the strip clubs, like, oh, that Friday night's going to be up. I'm like, dude, do you remember Monday? Well, of course he doesn't. He was hung over. But maybe Tuesday? Don't you remember how sick you were on Monday? Like, you know better. And by Friday, he was ready to go clubbing again. Isn't it crazy how the devil can steal the bad parts of our sinful life and make us think that we should go back? And that's exactly what's happening here. Now, it's not that leeks and garlics and, and all the, the melons and cucumbers were bad. I want you to think for a moment about the goodness of God giving you taste buds that you actually enjoy food. God made that. God made us to enjoy food because he could have said, oh, you can live off manna and it tastes the same. It's, it's probably a little bit bland. That's your food. Here, here's what I, I gathered this week as I was studying this, is that they were complaining about something that was meant to be temporary. It wasn't like the promised land was full of manna. It wasn't like God said, you know, in Egypt, you had the leeks and the onions and the garlics and the spices and the fish and all the, all the meat you could eat. I'm taking that away. You're just going to get manna for the rest of your life. Here's what they were complaining. They were complaining about God's temporary provision in that temporary season. And I think that's what frustrated God. But one thing you know about complainers is complaining is contagious. Isn't it? Complaining is contagious. It is. You have one little kid, you know, one of your kids that complains about dinner. All of a sudden, other kids, he starts complaining about dinner. Moms, could I tell you something, or dads, whoever cooks, that, that God does not expect you to be a short order cook. I'm going to make, I'm going to give you some freedom here. Don't give your kids a menu. You know where I grew up? When I grew up, you ate what mama made. If you didn't eat what mama made, you didn't eat. I just set some of you free. All right, you can make this the good news, and they want nuggets. My granddaughter wanted chicken nuggets for breakfast yesterday. I was like, no, have a donut, right? Chicken nuggets are just good. No, and that's what she wanted. I'm like, well, I guess if you wanted chicken, that's fine. But here's what they did. They brought up the good food they had in Egypt. Let me just read my notes here. But they didn't bring the bad stuff up. It's odd how the pain of sin seems to be quickly forgotten. Oh, it wasn't that bad. We've all been caught in that lie. Now, the manna given, just here's just a fun fact. There was approximately 9 million pounds a day of manna that fell on the Israelites. How do we know that? Because there's actually a measurement that they were supposed to pick up. Okay, the biblical, he said, you, it's called a, um, oh shoot, it, it's, a, it's a Hebrew term. What's the measurement? Does anybody know what the measurement is? I knew what it was, and I didn't write it down because I knew I would remember. No, it's, not it's, a, it's a weight. It's a, um, I'll get it to you next week. Um, it's not going to change your life, just so you know. It's a, it's a it's, I can't think of it. But it was one of those things like, oh, I remember I didn't write it down. But they, were, they had a, a certain measurement that they were to collect every day. That's what God said. Take this much every day. It's like a, it equal basically a couple quarts. Um, and that was an everyday thing. So if you do the math on it, you can figure out if there's two to three million um, Israelites in the camp. We know there was 600,000 men, and they didn't count the women and children. Um, but that much poundage, that's a lot of poundage of manna that fell on the Israelites. 
But on the human side, I want you to think about this for a moment, you can see their complaint. Manna did get boring after a while. I mean, it, it fell in the same flavor, all right? And there's nothing wrong with foods that were missing, okay? There was nothing wrong with the foods that they were missing. God didn't give us taste buds. It was their complaining attitude that got them in trouble. That's what it was. It was the complaining of it. Um, they were complaining about God's provision in this season. Um, and they would know of Canaan as a land flow of milk and honey. So what I want to do is end with this. I want, here, here's what I believe that they were saying. What God has given us isn't enough. What God has given us isn't enough. That, that's what they were saying. What God has given us is not enough. I, I call this the Eve syndrome. We see it in the Garden of Eden. And again, I'm not blaming Eve. I'm just, the story is there. What did Eve do? She was put in a garden with a perfect man, perfect environment, perfection. And what did Satan offer her? One thing, this one thing, that one thing. God said you can have everything, but it's that one thing that you can't have and that's what the devil got her with. Perfection wasn't enough. And what did Adam do? Adam did it on, Eve was deceived. Adam just outright disobeyed. Okay, so, so Eve, she was deceived by that. Adam knew what he was doing. Perfection wasn't good enough. So in our lives, what I don't want God to do is look at us and say, you know, I've blessed you a lot, but you're still complaining. You're still complaining. Now, there's legitimate complaints. There's legitimate things that we can pray about. And um, if we never have any complaints, prayer would not be needed, right? So not all complaining is bad, just, just so we know. We, we should be able to vent. Um, you know, if you don't ever vent, you will explode. You know, water heaters have a little vent on top for a reason. Whether they reach a certain temperature and what they do, it's a pressure valve. Does everybody know that? Good, I taught you some plumbing things. All right, there's a pressure valve on top. It gets too hot. It, it, it releases a pressure. I have heard of water heaters malfunctioning and actually blowing out of houses, it just exploding. I hope that you don't live with somebody like that. I hope that you are not like that. What I want us to do tonight is, is pray and ask God to show us if there's areas in our lives that we're complaining when we shouldn't be. Is there areas in our lives that we're getting close to that sin, we're getting close to Egypt, we're getting that thing of maybe I should just go back to the world and I'm going to beg you not to do that. Don't do that. Don't go back. Okay? L live a life of no returns. Okay, it's not Amazon. It's not Costco. Okay, it's not a free return when you go back to what God delivered you out of. Amen? So let me pray for you. Lord, thank you again for this night. Thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for these stories, Lord, that we can read as I've read about the Israelites pretty much my whole life to see that they're wishy-washy is the way I would describe them, where they serve you and then they didn't. They'd serve you and they didn't, and they'd get complacent and they'd want to go back to what you deliver them out of. And I pray tonight, Lord, if there's just one person in this place that maybe is tempted to, to go back, Father, you would show them uh, where that path leads. It leads back to slavery. I pray for those who right now are they're just wondering, God, what do you want from me? Lord, I'm in a place in my life and I don't understand what's happening. Um, I haven't done anything wrong, Lord, but I don't hear your voice telling me which way to go. I pray that you give them comfort tonight, that, that you know what you're doing with their life, that their job is to take one more step. And because your delay is not always a denial. I mean, your delay sometimes is, is your perfect will. And so give them the strength to take one more step. And we love you, give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, what I would ask you to do now is go find somebody and say hi to them, all right? I quit early so that you can go visit. Amen? All right. Love you all. See you Sunday. Thanks for your patience, and I didn't cough my way through it, so that's